call today's talk Elizabeth Bowen's Haunted Landscapes. And just to sort of preface what I'm going to say, I want to talk about why Elizabeth Bowen is obsessed with place, and particularly with North Cork, with her family home, and with the land that surrounds it, with the landscape that's there, the, the rural landscape that's there, the hills, the fields, everything about that area haunts not just her uh, fictional writing and her travel writing, but also her biographical writing. And it seems to be something that she goes back to again and again in her writing. And I want to look at why that's so. Why does a writer of her stature um, feel so tied to North Cork. And I think I'll begin by giving you a little bit of an idea of her background, uh, her history, uh, her status as a writer, as an Irish writer. So she was born in 1899, so born right at the end of uh, the 19th century. And she died in, let me just check, uh, she died in 1973. And if we think about the history of Ireland during that period, of Ireland and England, and indeed of the whole world at that period, she lived through the uh, under, being under British rule first uh, in, um, in North Cork, then through uh, the uh, War of Independence, through the Civil War, into Irish independence. And then on the world stage, she lived through the First World War, and again through the Second World War. So that period of, of history is a really dramatic period of history. So much is happening, so much is going on, so many changes occur. So I think most people were looking for a way to ground themselves, to find a place that made them feel safe and secure. And for Bowen, that was North Cork all the area around Far Farahee, around Bowen's Court itself, the family home, which is, had been long established when Elizabeth was born. Uh, her ancestor, the first Henry Bowen, uh, came over with Cromwell's ar army and he was granted large tract of land in North Cork in payment for his services uh, to the English crown. And from there, uh, the family remained there in that area of North Cork, built a house there, and this is where Elizabeth is feels safe and grounded. And the history of her own life then, she was born in Dublin. So uh, just to recap then, we her life is set against the backdrop of this really turbulent period in history. And then we have a turbulent history of her own to compound that sense of dislocation. So she was born in Dublin, her father was a solicitor, uh, she was an only child, and the family spent the winter in Dublin and the summers in Bowen's Court. So re she returned every year during her childhood uh, to Bowen's Court for the summer. And it was there she found a sense of who she was and how to think about of herself, how to think about herself in Ireland. Um, when she was seven, her father had a nervous breakdown, or what was at that time termed a nervous breakdown, and the cure for that at the time was isolation. So he was um, sent away, and uh, Elizabeth and her mother were also packed off uh, to the UK. So they lived uh, across many different family members uh, across the southern uh, counties of, of um, England during this period. As if that wasn't enough, when she was 12, her mother died um, and she was then passed around through various relations. When her father recovered, he remarried and Elizabeth then began to spend her summers back in Bowen's Court again. When she was finished boarding school, which is where one of the family members she was staying with sent her, uh, she attended art school for two years and we see the effects of that art training in most of her writing. Uh, she is very pictorial in what she does. When she describes something, you can see it, feel it, taste it. It's colourful and really dramatic. Um, when she uh, decided that art wasn't going to be the route for her, like many other Irish writers have done the same, uh, she then turned to writing. Um, she's a prolific writer. Uh, she published 10 novels during her lifetime, multiple volumes of short stories, many of them ghost stories in the Gothic tradition. Uh, she published um, 
an amazing amount of reviews. So she was an extraordinarily, um, as I said, prolific writer, publishing all the time. The uh, when she married, then uh, she married Alan Cameron, Englishman who had returned from the First World War, and. Uh, when she married him they went to live in Oxford and there she moved around among many of the Bloomsbury writers, people like um, um, Virginia Woolf uh, and her husband and many of the other writers that circled around Oxford and London at that time. Uh, when her husband got promoted they went to live in London and she spent all of the Second World War years in London. Um, living uh, right in the heart of London and she worked as an air raid warden uh, during that time as well. So an extraordinary career. Um, during uh, the and after the war herself and her husband spent the summers at Bowen's Court always keeping that connection and then when Alan retired uh, they decided that they would retire and live full-time in Bowen's Court. Uh, that was in 1951 and in 1952 he died um, and Bowen was left there alone uh, in Bowen's Court and she struggled on for many years trying to keep the place together, huge uh, sort of demands, financial demands on keeping a house of that size um, and eventually and much against her own wishes she decided she would have to sell. Financially it just wasn't viable anymore and she sold it to a local man um, and I'm not going to give you his name but he promised that he would um, keep the house, make it a family home and breathe life into it again and Elizabeth was really happy with that and decided that that was fine. It was the, the way, uh, the best way for that forward for the house. Within a year after she'd left he had dismantled the whole thing and one of the saddest things you can see to this day if you go to visit Farahi and walk up the now treeless avenue, front avenue that's rotted and covered with thorns all that remains is just this desiccated uh, sort of space, a, a total emptiness. So briefly, we have Bowen then living through these really turbulent years in history and then her own turbulent life, that sense of dislocation, of moving from place to place. So you can see why she might be obsessed with, um, with landscape, with place, and particularly with Bowen's court. There are other reasons for this too, of course. Elizabeth Bowen was Anglo-Irish uh, and living in Ireland, particularly through uh, the early 1900s and in through the War of Independence and into the 19, early 1920s, Anglo-Irish families like her and the house that, uh, that they lived in Bowen's Court, they were under threat, very much so. And that also, that huge sense of needing to find a safe haven, find a safe place, is really important to Bowen. And it appears in her writing all the time, in her novels, particularly in a novel like The Last September, uh, but even more so in the big family history that she writes uh, during the Second World War. So when she's in London in the Second World War, she writes this long, detailed, well-researched family history called Bowen's Court. And that's where most of this um, sort of closeness to Bowen that we can achieve, that we will get from her. Uh, the, she, there she details uh, what her family were, uh, who they were, and how they came by what they had. And I think it's really interesting to think about that, that Bowen is, a, 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 I suppose, that last voice from that period, uh, from the Anglo-Irish class as well. And she feels this kind of burden of needing to justify them, needing to uh, make Bowen's Court a, a real home, make them part of that landscape. And that's what she goes about doing in Bowen's Court, setting about uh, making that or rooting her family in that particular place. And remember I said earlier the first Bowen, uh, Henry Bowen, came over from Wales with Cromwell's army. So by the time Elizabeth is born, there are already hundreds of years in Ireland, living constantly in the one place. And what Bowen says about them is that it's not just that they're there, it's that they inhabit not just 
uh, the physical house but the air around them and she talks about every time she comes back to Bowen's Court she can feel her ancestors in the air that the air is thick with their presence every time she stands at the front steps of Bowen's Court and looks out across the hills she can feel and breathe them and I think this breathing of presence of a long family history is really important to her to establish who and what she was. Her voice is poignant too, I think, a really sad voice from the past, because although the family had been there for thousands of, or hundreds of years, uh, by the time we get to Bowen, she's an only child, a girl, and she has no children herself. So we, she is truly the last of that line, the last of her own family line, the last of the Anglo-Irish. And sadly, today, as I said, when you go to visit Bowen's Court, even the house is gone. Nothing of it remains. When I first visited it with my students many, many years ago, uh, you could still walk down through the basement. You could still find, uh, you know, parts of the crockery on the floor in the basement. And it was still recognisable as the ruins of the house. The uh, cut stone from the front of the house, uh, parts of it were still there. Uh, now the, the two avenues that lead up to the house, all the trees had been felled, they were taken too. Uh, and it was, um, you know, still partly recognisable, I think. There was a garden wall left as well in the distance. Uh, but I was back there just before the lockdown and nothing remains now. It's all gone, just rubble. Uh, no sense of anything except a huge sense of loss and emptiness. And I think that's really striking for anybody who's interested in Bowen. Uh, just that feeling of emptiness and that she somehow has invested that place with a presence, even though there's nothing there. Bowen herself is buried in the church that adjoins um, the house at Bowen's Court, Farahee Church. Uh, you can see it from the front steps of where the house wa was. Uh, she's buried there, her husband too, uh, Alan Cameron is buried there. Ancestors are there as well. Um, we used to, before the lockdown, have a Bowen's uh, uh, weekend uh, once a year, and of course that's gone now, as most things are. Um, the importance of landscape for Bowen appears particularly, I think, in her writing. For Bowen, the most striking hallmark of her family and the way they behaved, their ethos, was that they never really showed their feelings. It was considered impolite, not what you would do to show anxiety or fear or even indeed great happiness. So for instance, she said things like, you know, when somebody dies, uh, you wash the dogs and make sandwiches. So nothing, you don't, you take everything on the chin. It's all stiff upper lip. And this idea of fashioning this kind of style, way of behaving, way of talking, is in all of her novels. Uh, so, so much so that none of her characters seem to feel things. Uh, they don't seem to be able to, not that they don't feel, but Bowen can't make that apparent to us through the character's speech, through their actions, or even through their thoughts. Even when we go in internally to a character's mind, she doesn't, be, she doesn't seem to be able to tell us that they're sad or happy. We have to deduce that from the surroundings. So for instance, if we take at the end of the last September, uh, the house, um, it, it's based on a house very like Bones Court. It's set in um, 1922 and it's burnt out right at the end of the novel. And the, uh, when the, the owners of the house, Lord and Lady Naylor, stand outside the house and watch it burn, they're speechless. They have nothing to say. They don't say anything. They just stand there stoically. But up at the top of the avenue, a gate stands open aghast. So the landscape feels the trauma. And this is true of all of her novels. Nothing uh, is uh, more important to her than setting, landscape, 
tables and chairs, uh, all of those things feel when the characters can't. So the this sense of style um, and sense of creating this uh, sense of who her family were uh, becomes part of this. Uh, the um, this fashioning of a style that doesn't allow you to speak of your emotions or your trials or your tribulations, that then makes landscape, place and grounding so important. So all of this dovetails back into this sense of the grounding or the importance of place, the importance of soil and feet on the ground and for, for Bowen houses were just so important. No novel, no short story takes place outside of a house in Bowen's writing. Everything is firmly set in the drawing rooms, primarily in the drawing rooms, very little in the bedrooms in Bowen's uh, writing, in the drawing rooms uh, and the libraries of these big houses that she writes about. Um, and again, they're what imp are important. The descriptions of those, the, the upholstery, the, it's very often it's the uh, portraits of the uh, ancestors on the walls that feel, rather than the characters who sit under them in the dry dining rooms having dinner and feeling wretched. And it's the ancestors who feel that trauma. And one last thing I'd like to talk about, and that's Bowen's obsession with ghosts and ghostly things. She's not alone in this, if any of you are familiar with Yeats's writing and Yeats's obsession with fairies and ghosts and what happens just outside the normal. Uh, it won't be a surprise that Bowen too, being not a direct contemporary of Yeats, remember Yeats dies in 1939, just at the outbreak of the First World War. So uh, Bowen is 39 when Yeats dies, so she's bound to have been influenced by him and the kind of culture that surrounded him. But Bowen wrote many, many ghost stories. And if I was to make one recommendation of one of the best, short, amusing ghost stories I know, uh, then it would be um, one called Hand in Glove. Highly recommend it. It's not going to make you sleepless at night, but it's going to highly entertain you. Uh, but ghosts uh, for Bowen, she says, are, are real things not something to be feared, not something that's outside of our knowledge or our understanding, but something that lies side by side with the world as we know it. So this idea of her ancestors haunting uh, the air that you breathe around Bowen's Court, even to this day, is very much part of what she seems to believe. According to her writings, we have no uh, reason to disbelieve her when she says this. but. Certainly any uh, student of her writing or any casual reader of her novels will be aware of that. One last thing to say to you about Bowen, if you do, uh, and I hope you will, think about picking up maybe one of her novels or a collection of her short stories, and there are loads of them here in the library. Uh, all you have to do is just come in and borrow. One thing I would warn you about is that her style is quite interesting and interestingly uh, idiosyncratic. Um, Sean O'Fallon uh, called it uh, Bowen 747, kind of take-off style. And there's been a lot of academic work and attention paid to the way she writes. Uh, sentence get, sentences get inverted, the syntax is sometimes a little difficult. So I'm just warning you about that. For those who love style in writing, you'll love her. And if I were to recommend, as well as the short story I've just said, uh, the ghostly short story, Hand in Glove, the other uh, novel that I would certainly recommend is The Last September. You may have come across a film, there's been a film adaptation of it as well, which is really good. Maggie Smith, anybody, any fans of Maggie Smith will be interested because she plays Lady Naylor in it superbly. Um, the one uh, caveat I would have about the film is uh, John Banville uh, did the, uh, adapted it for film and did something dreadful to the ending. I'm not going to tell you what, but <laughs> I leave it to you to come and look at it. But it's an extremely good film, I think, apart from the ending. Uh, so captures um, everything that Bowen is looking for uh, in her style. And I think that 
I will probably finish with that in directing you to the novel first and the film second. Uh, and just see how film can capture what a novelist is trying to do. Uh, the um, focusing of the film, the, uh, the whole way it's presented is really, really interesting. What I was talking to you about, the uh, Bowen's way of making uh, places and things feel rather than characters, is really captured in the film adaptation, I think. So it's, it's both of those things are so well worth thinking about. And as well as we're in Heritage Week and we're thinking about our local writers and their the places where they lived and the places that they loved, I think you couldn't do better than Elizabeth Bowen, uh, a woman who tried desperately uh, to feel at home in North Cork, even though she does acknowledge in her writing that her place is predicated on a wrong, that her, their, the Anglo-Irish place in Ireland is predicated on a wrong. Finishing with those two recommendations, The Last September and the film adaptation and the ghost story, Hand in Glove, and enjoy.